Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jim Kennedy, and I'm a current Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Minority Health Policy, Emergency Physician, and MPH Candidate here at the Harvard School of Public Health. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today my colleague and friend, Dr. Yvette Robidoux, the ninth and current director of the Indian Health Service. Dr. Robidoux is a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe of South Dakota. As IHS director, she administers a $4 billion nationwide healthcare delivery system. The IHS is responsible for providing preventative, curative, and community health care to approximately 2 million American Indians and Alaska Natives in over 600 hospitals, clinics, and other settings throughout the United States. Dr. Robidoux most recently served as assistant professor of family and community medicine at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. She has conducted extensive research on American Indian health issues with a focus on diabetes in American Indians and Alaska Natives and American Indian health policy. She previously worked for the IHS as medical officer in Arizona at both the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation and the Gila River Indian Reservation while also serving as clinical director at the San Carlos unit. Dr. Robito attended Harvard University as an undergraduate, received her medical degree from the Harvard Medical School, and her master's degree in public health here at the Harvard School of Public Health while completing the Commonwealth Fund Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy. She is past president of the Association of American Indian Physicians and co-editor of the American Public Health Association's book, Promises to Keep Public Health Policy for American Indians and Alaska Natives in the 21st Century. She has authored several monographs and peer-reviewed numerous publications on American Indian and Alaska, health, Alaska Native health issues, research, and policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bette Robidoux. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Blendon. Uh, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you here, this is a continuation of a series that we started. The series has one goal. It's to really allow people to understand how people, when they make critical decisions that affect people's lives, think about them, go about them, the forces that shape their lives. So the generation of people in this room and who will see this uh, hopefully through thousands of uh, viewing the online webcasts, will have insights that when it's their turn, and we expect you to be in these roles as the years go on, how you go about making these decisions. Uh, this is a unique privilege, as Jim mentioned, in that we're bringing back someone who is part of the family. And for many of us early on, absolutely said she was gonna lead one of these major institutions. So as we know from the past uh, formats, uh, we'll have uh, about 10 or 15 minutes of remarks related to decision making, and then it's one question for me and the rest is of all you. Thanks again for coming back. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk with all of you today and share a little bit of my experience. I, really loved attending Harvard School of Public Health. I think the time that I spent here was critical in both motivating me and helping me focus on where I wanted to go with the future and certainly appreciated your um, mentorship and um, the, what a great experience it was. Well, I am the director of the Indian Health Service. Um, if you'd have asked me when I was 16 years old if I was going to be the director of this major federal agency, I would have laughed and thought that was pretty funny. Um, you know, I started out as a patient in the Indian Health Service as a child. Um, I experienced all of the challenges that this organization faces today back when I was a young child. When I would um, go to see the doctor. I really wasn't sure who I was going to see because the do doctors came and went. This is a federal health care system that is uh, underfunded that provides um, health care on or near Indian reservations. And so when my mother would say we need to go to the Indian Health Service, I'd say, oh no. I'd pack a book bag full of books and would wait on average four to six hours to see a doctor. And then when I saw the doctor, I had never seen them before because the doctors came and went. And then hopefully I would get the right treatment. And that while we were waiting in the waiting room, I'd hear stories of the poor care that people had been provided or the complications or poor outcomes that my relatives had, had gotten. So there was a lot of fear going to the Indian Health Service as well. But one day after a particularly troubling uh, event with one of my fam family members, I thought, you know, maybe the problem with the Indian Health Service 
is that there aren't that many physicians from Indian communities. And maybe we could improve the healthcare better um, having people from our own communities be in charge. And so I started to get interested in becoming a doctor at that time. Um, and when I mentioned to my family that I wanted to be a doctor, my grandmother said, well, good, then you can be the director someday and you can fix it. <laughs> Which was like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I laughed at the time. Well, I was grateful to have my education at Harvard and uh, was so excited to go work as a physician in Indian communities. I chose not to go back to Indian health facilities in South Dakota because of the politics of Native communities and my family was very well known and I wanted to have the chance to become a physician in my own right. So that's why I went to Arizona. Um, there I was with this great Harvard education ready to change the world and I was soon um, exposed to what it's like to be on the other side of the medical encounter and to be the physician who everybody didn't know and didn't trust. I did the best I could to provide the best quality of care, but I soon learned how difficult it is when you don't have the equipment you need, you don't have enough staff, and there's not enough time and not enough resources for everything. And suddenly I realized the frustrations of working in an underfunded system. So I took some thinking and realized, well, maybe there's a different way for me to make a contribution. And I looked around and noticed that people doing all the fun things in the Indian health system had MPH behind their names. <laughs> so just at that time, fortunately, I got the brochure uh, for the Commonwealth Fund Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy. It was the first year of the program. And realized that was a way to get a master's in public health, but maybe get some new tools in my quest to try to improve the quality of health care for American Indians and Alaska Natives, <coughs> which has really been my goal from the beginning when I decided to be a physician. So I did the training and it took me in a different path. I actually spent the next 11 years in academics doing research on diabetes and quality of care. I, I figured one way to help the system would be to provide the data to help justify why we needed more resources for our system and the ways that we could improve quality. So I had a great time in academics until one day I got a phone call and it was a request to come help with the Obama uh, transition team uh, for the new administration. And I didn't even know what a transition team was, but basically it was after the election to help the administration prepare uh, for the new job that they needed to do and they wanted me to help. So I helped with that. and. Um, realized that there was a great sense of change. Um, there was a great message of we need to change and as I helped them understand Indian health, realized that there was a great call for change from the patients and the staff and the tribes that are served by the Indian Health Service. And so then about two months later, I got another call um, asking me if I would like to be nominated to be the director of the Indian Health Service, which was really actually a surprise because I really felt that if I was going to have the opportunity to serve as director, it would be later in my career. Um, but apparently they felt that I was the right person for the job based on sort of the feedback that they had received. <clears throat> and you know, so, you know, if you think about it, every parent's uh, when a parent finds out that their child is, has been asked by the president to lead a federal agency, you would think that that would be a positive thing. But as I went out in the living room and said to my mother, who lived with me at the time, um, hey, Mom, uh, President Obama wants me to be the director of the Indian Health Service. What do you think? You know, because she lives with me and I care for her, so she needed to be on board because she would be coming with me. And she looked at me and, you know, most American Indians' parents would probably be thrilled. My mother said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason she said, why would you want to do that, is she knew what a difficult job it would be. There are enormous challenges in the Indian Health Service, challenges with um, staff and the way that the organization does business, um, many dysfunctional aspects, problems and challenges with the lack of resources and the lack of staff. And 
you know, general discontent with the organization. And so certainly my mother knew it would be a challenging job. But I talked with her and I said, you know, if there's any point in time where I think we have a chance at making progress, at changing and improving the Indian Health Service, it's with this administration because what I'd learned through the transition is President Obama actually knows that tribes exist and he is very supportive of the Indian Health Service of trying to change and improve it. Um, Secretary Sebelius is very supportive of trying to get more resources and support the Indian Health Service. and. And in my work through the transition and my other policy work, I knew there was bipartisan support in Congress for the Indian Health Service. It's just that they'd never gotten good budgets from the administration, and so they weren't able to fund us at the level they wanted to. So I suddenly realized that this is really a moment in time where there's so much support that it really is an optimal time to try to make significant progress in improving the organization. And so after I explained that to my mother, she said, OK, I'll go with you. So I went through the whole confirmation process and had to decide what to do with this incredible challenge. And so um, I realized that the best thing for me to do at that point was to listen. Because my lesson of being a young physician going into an Indian community was it wasn't about me and what I wanted. It was about what the stakeholders and the, the patients that we served wanted. It, in order for me as a leader to be able to motivate change, it wasn't going to be because I told people to do something. It was really going to be more about motivating people to change within the system and motivating our staff to be able to make those changes. And the only way to do that was really to listen. Uh, so I did spend time listening. I requested input from my staff. I requested input from our patients. And I also did a formal consultation with tribes. And what are your priorities for change? How would you like, we know that we have enormous challenges. What are the top three things that you would like us to focus on over the next few years? Acknowledging that we did have an enormous challenge and that we couldn't fix it all at once. And people really appreciated that approach, and we got a lot of feedback. I got thousands of emails. We, got, we created an email address where people could email things in. I held several sessions where I listened to what people wanted. And it was a little bit of a surprise what the results were. While all of my concerns had been about the quality of care, and I thought that I would receive a lot of input about how clinical services needed to be improved, Actually, the top recommendations fell into two categories. One, we need to improve the way the organization does business. And two, we have to improve how you lead and manage people. And what that meant was that people felt that they couldn't provide good care or meet the mission of the agency because of a lot of the administrative dysfunction. A lot of the uh, policies and practices didn't make sense or didn't work. and that. They noticed that people were not performing well and they were not being held accountable and that managers were not treating people fairly. And if you have the co that underlying context, it's very difficult for people to do the job they need to do. And so it actually was very helpful to get this input because it helped me know that we have to work on some very basic and fundamental things, how the organization is run, how we're doing business in a number of areas. And so really the focus of the last two and a half years has been improving the way we do business, setting a strong tone at the top about what expectations are, focusing on things like customer service, professionalism, fairness, training managers, improving the way we manage our budget, and improving the way that we make decisions, all of these sort of basic fundamental things. And it turns out that making improvements in those have actually improved our ability to um, uh, provide clinical care. This year, for the first time ever, the Indian Health Service met all of its targets for its clinical GIPRA indicators, the Government Performance and Result Act measures that we have to report to Congress. And we met them for both IHS-run facilities and tribally-run facilities. And we wouldn't have been able to do that unless we had made improvements in sort of overall agency accountability and management. And so I think that it's a step in the right direction. I think we have much more to do, but I'm really grateful that 
for the input that I have received and grateful for the education I had at Harvard School of Public Health, which taught me that as a leader, it's about motivating others and not really about what I necessarily want to have happen. And um, the, the proof that it worked was at a recent meeting, a tribal leader came up to me and um, I hadn't really met her before. And she said, you know, I've been watching you over the last couple of years. And I want to say that I really appreciate the fact that when you started, you didn't just start and say, here's what I'm going to do with your ideas. The first thing you did was listen. And um, I realized someone noticed uh, that there was a different strategy. And she said, I really very much appreciate that because of you listening, then we all move forward with you in the change of the organization. And so um, it really turned out that that has been helpful. Um, and has done uh, a lot of good things. The only other thing I offer is one of the decisions I had to make was how would we talk about change? How would we talk about how we're changing and improving the organization? And I knew that we had received a lot of input. And the problem in the past is that all you hear about the Indian Health Service is the negative things. Either there's stories of us being investigated or stories of horrible outcomes for our patients. And so I've actually worked with our public affairs staff to do more engaging with the media, to do more in presenting, and to also to provide a framework for how we talk about change in the organization. Um, I basically have four priorities. They're the same four priorities. All of my speeches are structured around the same priorities. And um, it now, two and a half years later, the tribes are using that language and the patients are starting to use that language when they talk about the issues. Those priorities are one, to renew and strengthen our partnership with tribes. I really feel the only way we're going to improve the health of our communities is to work in partnership with them. This has resonated well with the tribes that we serve um, and has been the basis for many improvements we've had in communicating with the tribes that we work with. Um, the second priority is to reform the Indian Health Service. And it's been great to talk about changing and improving the Indian Health Service in the con context of health reform, the Affordable Care Act, which included an authorization bill for us, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. And so it's, uh, we've been able to talk about how we're changing and improving the organization um, and framing some of our efforts under that priority. The third priority is to improve the quality of and access to care, and this is where we get to talk about customer service and improving how we provide services, changing the way we deliver services, creating a more patient-centered medical home, and um, this is an area where tribes uh, really love to have conversations about how to make care better. And the final priority is making everything transparent, accountable, fair, and inclusive. And these are sort of principles for how we do business, trying to give more information out, trying to hold employees accountable for poor performance and also to make sure that we're rewarding employees for good performance and overall creating a system that's more fair so that people can focus on the good work that they need to do to provide health care. And being inclusive of all the stakeholders that we serve, including tribes, our direct service um, uh, programs as well as our urban Indians that we serve as well. So talking about this, the priorities very simply, repeatedly, over and over again. Now I have tribal leaders saying, well, I'd like to talk about how we're working in partnership, and then they, they'll talk about this, or let's talk about your third priority is to improve quality. Let's talk about our clinic. And so the nice thing is we all have a common language to talk about. and. You know, I, what I just used to do before is have a strategic plan and a big process to define hundreds of measures under many objectives in the strategic plan. And when I got there, I basically said, we're not going to follow it. We're going to follow our priorities. And people didn't like that at first. And then they're like, she doesn't know what she's doing or whatever. But if you ask people today what's in the strategic plan that just expired for 2011, nobody knows but they can say what my four priorities are. And that helps us have a conversation about how to improve the agency. So we don't have a strategic plan, but we have priorities and a framework for having the conversation about how to improve the organization. The Indian Health Service is better 
it's not fixed, and I'm not going to be able to fix it in these four years or the next four years uh, that I am certainly hoping we have. Um, but at least it's create, we've been able to create a framework for how people talk about how we improve the organization. And it's based on the input we got from them. And I see a lot of our, our tribes and I see a lot of our facilities using those priorities to shape and frame the improvement initiatives that they're doing. So I think we're off to a good start. Um, certainly we've got a lot of more work to do, um, but I really feel like the decisions that I've made around managing this large dysfunctional and enormously challenging organization have been very helpful and have been well informed by my education that I received here at Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you. I get one question and it's, the rest is all yours. The, um, in your opening remarks, you remembered that one of the things that really bothered you about the Indian Health Service was that you never saw the same physician. Now you have your finger on that decision making. Is this a problem that you can change? Have we altered it? If I was a patient, would I be telling you the same thing that I've never seen the same person over again? Or is it possible to change this? Um. I think it's a little better, but it's something that is in the bigger picture dependent on our resources. Um, if we don't have enough resources to hire the physicians we need and the salaries that are competitive with other health systems, then it's something we may never to be full, able to fully uh, address. So we are working with Congress and the administration to try to get more resources and to get better salaries for our healthcare providers. But I think our transitioning to a patient-centered medical home will help in part with that because with the physicians that we have, if we create a system where they can be guaranteed to at least see the same physicians that are in the clinic and be assigned to practice profiles where um, they can at least see the same team, medical team, then it will feel more like they're seeing the same people. So if they are assigned to a team that has the same nurses and clerks and um, physicians and mid-levels and uh, social worker and dietitian, each time they come to the clinic, they'll see the same group of people. And so that will create a level of familiarity and also better access to care so that they'll have less of that feeling that it's a lottery and they don't know who they're going to see the next time they come in. Um, in some of our better staffed facilities and better resourced facilities, the patient-centered medical home is definitely achievable. In some of our more remote and difficult to recruit for facilities, it's a distant dream. But at least we are trying to work for it in all of our facilities. We've got some resources and are having some technical assistance for our programs to help with that. But it's, it's an example of a problem where there's not an easy fix. There's multiple factors that affect it. And what I can do while I'm here is try to have influence on each of those factors. And some will be successful and some won't. Um, but at least we can make as much progress as we can. Your turn. Um. Good morning. Uh, Martin Reedy. I'm a first year student in the Society of Human Development and Health Program. I'm, uh, been looking forward to this day. Uh, I'm a resident. Originally, I'm an original resident from Oklahoma, so we do have a large Native American population. But I find that there's a lot I still don't know about it. And you mentioned some of the obstacles to hiring talented uh, individuals that can come out and assist IHS. What are, what are some of the, you mentioned the patient-centered medical home, but there, are there other alternatives outside of that that you can borrow from either private or other government agencies that might be able to assist with this uh, issue. Because I do have a friend who works in Alaska, and she's mentioned some of the, I forget what they refer to it as, when they select the doctors and they have their areas of the uh, hinterland, for lack of a better term, where they fly the doctors out to remote villages. They spend a week with the uh, villagers, and then they fly them back in to either Anchorage or Juneau. And are, can you talk, speak to any of those types of programs you might be looking at? Yes, recruitment and retention of primary care doctors, which is mostly what we need, or primary care providers, is very challenging for all of rural America. 
um, particularly for us because of our non-competitive salaries, but we are working on trying to raise those. Um, compensation is an issue, and so we also have a loan repayment program where people can come and work for us for a period of time and then get their loans repaid, and that makes a big difference for a lot of people. We also just recently worked with HRSA, the Health Resource and Services Administration. My friend, uh, um, Dr. Mary Wakefield, and I sat down and said, well, what can we do together as a collaborative activity? And it turns out that uh, we were able to make all of the Indian health sites eligible for the National Health Service Corps so that we could be eligible to have um, payback um, providers uh, from their loan and scholarship programs. And it, it's crazy that all of our sites already weren't a part of it, but it turned out it just required leadership to say, let's make it happen. And so um, we had a series of meetings and realized it was a very simple fix. So now we have that as an opportunity as well. Um, some of our sites have um, interesting options. Some places have uh, positions where you can go and visit multiple sites as a part of your practice. Um, some sites have um, uh, sort of hospitalist positions or emergency room positions or tailored positions. The, the frightening thing for a lot of physicians and what happened to me is I was trained in internal medicine and then I went to work at San Carlos in their Indian Health Service Hospital out of the middle of nowhere. Um, I had to be a family physician. I had to see kids. I had to deliver babies. I had to do suturing and even had to reduce a few shoulders and things like that, which, you know, in medical school, maybe I saw once or twice. Fortunately, my residency at the Brigham helped me get more exposure in that, so I felt a little bit more comfortable. Um, but the thing about working in the Indian Health Service is you're a part of a team, and there's really a team spirit, so that when you are a part of a facility, people pitch in and help each other, so that, um, you know, the pediatrician would help me when I saw a little six-week-old or the, um, you know, there might have been someone who had skills in delivering babies who'd be willing to do it for me instead of me and for better for the patient. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of different kinds of options you can have working in the Indian Health Service. I think our, um, the other problem we have is with retention. Because, remember I mentioned people wanted us to improve the way we do business and how we lead and manage people, we've got physicians who left because they got frustrated with the system and frustrated with the inequities and frustrated with the dysfunction. And so I'm hoping that if we can fix some of these fundamental ways that we do business in our facilities, that will help with retention efforts. And really our efforts towards the patient-centered medical home is very exciting for physicians because they have a greater role in determining how the clinic runs. So it gives them more um, opportunities really to be able to um, impact how they practice. So um, there's a number of strategies that we're looking at to try to improve our recruitment retention, but we're very concerned about the future shortage of primary care physicians and healthcare providers that everybody's facing and the increased competition there will be to get primary care practitioners in our communities. We're also looking at things like mid-level providers who can help us more and even in Alaska they have dental health aides which is another innovative way to train community members to do some of the simple tasks under the, under the supervision of dentists. And so we're trying to get creative because we realize the primary care shortage is looming on the horizon. We already feel it and we're trying to look at all the different ways that we can improve recruitment. Hello, my name is Jennifer Erdrick. I'm um, an MPH student and my family is Turtle Mountain Ojibwe from North Dakota. Um, I, my question has to do with there's so much national attention on health care reform and uh, IHS is often overlooked and it's almost a centralized, socialized system here that is a medical home for thousands of underserved people. So I'm wondering if we could change the question a little bit as to what IHS can always learn from others and maybe ask what can mainstream America learn from IHS in this era of health care reform? Great. Well, we really think that the rest of America can learn quite a bit from the Indian Health Service. Um, 
we can provide quality health care at much less cost um, because we have to. You know, we just don't have the resources to waste, and so we found very efficient methods for providing the delivery of health care. Um, we also provide a great example of how health relates to the community within which our patients live. And there's so many social determinants of health that you really can't solve health problems by just focusing on what you do in the clinic. You really need to look at the community and the factors that influence an individual's health. And I think we do that well in the Indian Health Service. We've always had a strong public health and community component. I think that we have examples of working in partnership with tribes in terms of um, understanding what their priorities are and what improvements they would like to see in the healthcare system. I think that some of our innovative programs like the Special Diabetes Program for Indians has, has shown examples of how to do diabetes education and outreach to communities in culturally appropriate ways. Um, I've told the story of how if you wanted to hold a patient education class on how to prevent diabetes and you put a sign up and said we're going to hold this meeting at seven o'clock in the evening, really nobody would show up. <laughs> you know, people have a lot more priorities to deal with. But what we realized is that people are tied so much to preserving their culture that so, what if some of our programs have done is, what they'll do is they'll hold a, a beadwork class, how to learn how to do beadwork, or a basket making class to learn um, some of the traditions, or a language class. And then in the middle of the class, they'll bring in a diabetes educator. <laughs> While people are working on their beadwork, the educator will come in and say, I'd like to spend a few minutes teaching you how you can, you can uh, prevent you and your family from getting diabetes. And those have been very well received because it, 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 you know, they're learning a part of their culture and then they can learn how to take care of their health. And it can help tie in the culture. If you think about American Indians and Alaska Natives, over a century ago, we were healthy. Um, you know, we uh, were more physically active. Uh, we ate less. We ate more healthy foods you know, more natural foods, berries and um, lean buffalo and uh, corn and things that were grown from the ground. Now that we've had to adapt to a more Western lifestyle, we've ended up having high rates of obesity and high rates of diabetes and high rates of cancer and things that we really didn't experience before. There's not a word in Native American language for diabetes because it really didn't exist over a century ago. It just exists now due to obesity. So um, I think the, the lesson of the fact that a patient doesn't exist in isolation, they exist within a family, and they exist within a community, and they exist within a culture, I think are things that we at the Indian Health Service have known for many, many years and have focused on trying to um, address the health needs of patients within a community and I think that's probably the greatest lesson we could give to the rest of the United States is the, some of the successes we've had in our communities. Uh, I'm Sarah El Samurai. I'm a second year master's student in environmental health and um, actually in college I spent um, a little bit of time on the Navajo Reservation in Chinle in Arizona. And um, one thing actually that motivated me to study environmental health was that so many people talked about the increased cancer prevalence, um, some people attributing it to the uranium mines there and um, things like that, especially breast cancer increases. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and if, there, if there's been any work to mitigate that environmental effects or any cleanup or anything like that? There's been quite a bit of work on looking at environmental health issues in American Indian Alaska Native communities. There have been instances of, you know, uranium mining in the Navajo Reservation. There have been um, sort of military um, uh, waste and sites in Indian communities. If you think about where American and Alaska Native communities are where the reservations were set up. They were usually set up on some of the most challenging lands in each state. And unfortunately, people have taken advantage of that, and toxic <coughs> sites have 
waste has been dumped or toxic exposures have occurred. Uh, groundwater has been contaminated and, and a number of other things. And so um, we actually have a, a very robust environmental health program and we know that there's also a very robust partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency has its own tribal um, program that helps um, tribes really take the lead in investigating some of these issues on their communities and getting resources to help uh, in the case of if a cleanup is needed or if an investigation is needed or if compensation is needed and then of course understanding what the health issues may be and I think that these kinds of concerns are very high in the concerns that tribes have. Um, and I was talking earlier <coughs> with some students about the fact that tribes are wondering why they have an increased rate of cancer in their communities and their immediate thought is to these environmental exposures because there have been instances where there have been some negative exposures that have threatened the health of the communities there. Um, but probably the more common reason for cancer are things like smoking and obesity and, and age. You know, the American Indian population is actually, the life expectancy has, has increased quite a bit over the last several um, decades. So. Um, trying to provide education about the various causes of cancer and other illnesses and to investigate when investigations are needed, but also to help people understand that there are other causes for some of these illnesses has been an important part of outreach that I think we need right now. I think every tribe lately, when they talk about hearing that more people in their community are dying about cancer, um, they think it's a toxic exposure of some kind, uh, some mysterious Thing that has happened in their community and it may well be and we do need to do those um, investigations because we know that it has occurred in the past um, but we also do know that there are more common preventable causes of cancer that we need to educate people on as well and we don't want them to miss the opportunity to learn about those as well so um, I have to mention environmental health I um, taught at the School of Public Health at University of Arizona and I had a course on Indian health policy. And then suddenly um, one of the faculty asked me to teach on environmental health. I was like, well, I'm not trained in environmental health. They're like, oh, well, you know about Indian health. And that's one of the challenges we have when we work in the Indian health um, area is people think that we're, we know about every possible subject related to Indian health just by nature of being American Indian or knowing something in that area. And so I kind of chuckled and I said, I can't teach about environmental health issues. I wasn't trained in it. And they're like, well, you're the closest thing we have. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I did spend, I, I, there was no way out. So um, I spent a lot of time sort of learning about some of the environmental health issues and what resources are available to tribes and how tribes are really taking sort of an advocacy role in defending their communities against some of these issues. And so it's an area of interest of mine and I'm glad you raised it today. Hi, good afternoon. Monica Burrell, Commonwealth Fund Fellow in the MPH program. I wonder um, if you could give us some advice on affecting changing attitudes in the majority. So when you're working for a vulnerable minority, especially in a time of limited resources, it looks like you've been able to make so many positive changes. How do you bring the majority along? And I'm thinking especially about politicians, <coughs> politicians and policymakers. Right, well, you know, you think of the, the federal budget and my budget of four billion sounds like a lot, but when you think of NIH and their hundreds of billions of dollars, and uh, you know the entire budget for health and human services were just a small part of it, and it is important that we create more awareness of what our issues are, and that you know we're we're not just another group advocating for funds. You know the, the responsibility for American Indian Alaska Native Health is related to the responsibility of the federal government based on treaties and court decisions and agreements of the past and sort of a way of righting the wrongs that, that had occurred in the past and that legally there is a special relate government to government relationship with tribes. Uh, we are a racial minority but we also have a special political relationship with the federal government and trying to help people understand that while we 
are a part of the minority health issues of the country, we also have this special political relationship. And I think that um, it's my job to help educate about that and to help um, encourage tribes and others who work in Indian health to continue to educate about that sort of our unique and special status and the responsibility that the federal government has. I do that every time I give a presentation. I know that we have uh, used the media, we use our website um, to educate about that and certainly we go to Congress and, and talk about that as well when I testify or when I meet with Congress. But the great thing is I think Congress in general does understand there are people in Congress who are in positions of influence who really do get the fact that there is this responsibility of the federal government to provide for the health and welfare of Indian people and there's been numerous legislation passed and um, um, many policies implemented to try to address that. And If you think about the Indian Health Service, we have a lot of support. Um, as I mentioned before, it's an extraordinary time where the president, the secretary, bipartisan support in Congress, people really understand the issues. And if you look at the federal budget over the last two years, um, the Indian Health Service is one of very few programs that has gotten an increase, um, even in a time of fiscal restraint. So it does seem like the right people understand what our issue is. It's just a matter of trying to address the enormous need that we have. But I use every opportunity that I can to teach about American Indian health and to teach about the, the responsibility of the federal government and how we're trying to meet that responsibility and to educate people about the, the needs of our population, which are quite significant. And it's a constant um, effort. I think if you you know, there are still people today who don't understand. They think I still live in a teepee or they think that, you know, why am I not wearing turquoise or, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stereotypes about American Indians and um, I am constantly have a role to try to defy those stereotypes and to try to um, teach people what the real need is. We have people who are living in third world conditions on our Indian reservations and that's why we're getting more attention with this administration and that's why we're getting more support and that's why it's um, triply important for us to do everything we can to help make those improvements. So um, I think in terms of communication about the particular needs of a group, I think it's important to think of ways to provide that education in a non-threatening way and to provide that education in, in a way that helps people understand what the true need is. Um, I think that, um, you know, in the past there had been a lot of work towards sort of guilting people into supporting Indian health. But if you look at the facts, if you look at the disparities we face and the, the relationship we have and the, res the, the trust responsibility, all of that makes sense as to why the Indian health system needs support. Um, you know, my um, ancestors had treaties that were signed that said the federal government would provide for what we did and um, so I know that people in good faith are trying to meet that responsibility but it's an incredible challenge and so um, just thinking about ways to provide the, the facts and the education and to get the word out about um, what we're doing and I do try to uh, address audiences beyond the Indian Health Service because I think it's important that greater America know what our issues are. I don't know if you all saw the um, 2020 special uh, where Diane Sawyer went and um, did an interview on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And Certainly those kinds of media exposure help people see the great health disparities that we're facing and get a better understanding of why we're trying to do what we're doing. Hi, Dr. Robidoux. Um, I'm Kate. I'm a MP <coughs> student here at the School of Public Health. Um, you were speaking earlier about um, some of your efforts to change the administrative approach in a lot of the IHS clinics. Um, and I'm speaking with an N of one, but I spent some time uh, on the Spirit Lake Reservation in North Dakota, and a lot of the, um, there were some opinions voiced that perhaps some of the failings um, of the clinic on that reservation were coming from 
uh, some of the administrators that weren't necessarily local folks, um, to say nothing of the fact that they weren't necessarily native folks. Um, is there anything that IHS is trying to do to increase um, the capacity of sort of uh, local systems and also just sort of native individuals to go into IHS like yourself? Right. Well, we definitely feel like um, having people from the community that served actually responsible for decisions that are made about the services there is probably more likely to result in better decision making. Um, but the challenge is um, getting more people trained to be able to assume those positions. The education, the schools in Indian communities don't prepare American and Alaska Native students well uh, to go on to higher education. And of course, with the high rates of poverty, it's very difficult for students to go on to college. Um, the Indian Health Service has had a scholarship program for many years um, that has sort of pre-health and preparatory scholarships for college and that for a number, a wide range of health disciplines and, and public health disciplines and administrative positions. And then we also have a scholarship program for health professions and that's actually how I was able to go to Harvard. My family wasn't rich and I got the IHS scholarship and so I'm the first IHS director who actually received the IHS scholarship so I guess it does work. <laughs> <laughs> but so we have our scholarship program, we have our loan repayment program and um, we have extern programs where people can um, get experience working in the system. It's certainly not enough though. And so we rely on our tribal and our university partners to help us with that. We have agreements with several universities to, to partner together to try to get more American and Alaska Natives trained, and actually to get more people in general to be trained. I mean, I actually welcome anybody to work in the Indian Health Service, no matter where they come from. Um, and I think that we can help people be successful by giving them the information they need to be successful better orienting them, um, better welcoming them into the community, better informing them of what the issues are, and then also um, better ways of working together and partnering with our tribal communities. What was nice about where I worked is that the, the tribe welcomed me into their homes. They welcomed me to some of their cultural and community events. Uh, so that I got a chance to learn. I mean, even though I'm American Indian, I'm Rosebud Sioux. When I went to work for the San Carlos Apache Indians, it was a completely different world for me. I had to learn a completely different culture and custom. And so this issue of orienting our staff is really an important one, and I've asked our staff to, to work on it. We have some er areas that do a really good job of that. Um, and it's all a part of the, to the, the work on trying to improve customer service, and we're making a big um, uh, work on that. But the other piece of that also is accountability, and making sure that people who aren't performing well are properly managed and are um, given opportunities and ways to improve, and if they don't prove we do improve, we do hold them accountable. Um, there have been people in our system who've worked their way up the ranks that may not have had the opportunity to have education and gain the skills that they need for jobs and might be in over their head and there really hasn't been a way to help them and so um, we're trying to work on better mentorship and um, better training for staff. What we do at headquarters is we have a, a weekly brown bag session where I've asked my staff to volunteer to give a 15 to 20 minute lecture on a skill that they have to share with other employees so that we make sure that we spread the wealth and people can learn skills that they need to have. So I think if we improve the way we lead and manage people and if we work on ways to encourage young people to go into to work in Indian health, we can try to help the pipeline. But we're going to need a lot more help in this area um, because it's just an incredible challenge to have a, a young person from an Indian community with a school that maybe isn't the greatest school. It is a big challenge to get them so that they can graduate 
meet their requirements, go to college, meet their requirements, go to health professional school, and then successfully work. The other problem is people assume health professionals know how to manage, and they don't, because <laughs> you don't learn that in health professional school. So um, I think that we have to do better education of health professionals to say, you know, you go to medical school to learn how to be a great doctor. But if you want to manage a healthcare organization, you have the responsibility of gaining those skills to be able to do it well. And that's what really helped me here at Harvard School of Public Health. I, I did a lot of health administrative type classes because I knew I needed to gain those skills. Um, and um, as a health, as a physician, we just can't assume that we know how to run a healthcare organization. We have to learn those skills. And so we're looking at different ways to get access to more of that training available as well. You've got Bob, question number two. <laughs> uh, thinking back in your first year, what was the toughest decision that you think you had to make? And in retrospect, looking back, did it work out the way you thought it would? Well, one of the toughest decisions I had to make was who would be my leadership staff. So when I first came in, there was enormous pressure for me to fire everybody and start over. Enormous pressure, including congressional pressure. And so the way I looked at it was, well, in order for me to change this organization, if I brought in a bunch of new people, they wouldn't understand how to do it. Because working in a federal agency requires knowledge of the policies and regulations and laws that govern your program. And if I brought in new people, I'd have an, a learning curve. And that would take time. And it might lead to mistakes. And I didn't have that time. I mean, I'm certainly hopeful that we'll have another term. But if we don't, these four years are all I've got. And so um, there was such great hope for change. And I was the first IHS director that came from the outside. The people expected me to just mix it up and fire all the people they didn't like. I got emails. I got names. Um, but what I decided to do was I didn't have time. I needed the best qualified people around me. Now, if they weren't good managers or maybe there was something with them, I felt like I could work with that. So I really listened to all the input, and I realized the people working in the Indian Health Service at the leadership level really wanted the same things I wanted. They wanted us to get more funding. They saw hope with this new administration, and they wanted the organization to change. They just had not been allowed to do that in the past. Previous administrations, the IHS director had to publicly act like everything was fine. They had to tell Congress that we were doing a great job. I was the first director that was able to say we have problems and we need to address them, which made a big difference. And I could sense in the staff that people told me wouldn't be on my side that they would be on my side. So I had to take a leap of faith and say, I'm going to keep the well-qualified and committed people that already work there, even though a lot of people wanted me to get rid of them. And I'm going to work with them. Because I know, I fundamentally knew they wanted to the best for IHS and that they wanted things to improve. And I knew that some of the ways we were going to improve would be a check on what people were worried about. Um, and it was the best decision that I made. Um, it would have been a mistake to fire them because I have the best team supporting me right now. They're, they have worked in the system for 20 to 30 years. They have the skills. They if I have a question, they know the answer, and they also know how to work the system. And so I have really a great, strong team. There have been a few people who have left, and I think that it's just because, you know, in a system of greater accountability, people start to get nervous, um, and people realize that, you know, I am a strong manager, and I do expect a lot from my staff. So a few people have left, but that's been for the better. And I think that the team that I have around me is not only very strong, they're extremely loyal because they knew I could have fired them. <laughs> uh, but I, I love the team I work with. I uh, enjoy going to work every day. Uh, we've done some incredible things. 
Um, and I really, that was an extremely hard decision to make because it went against what a lot of people wanted me to do, but it was the right thing to do, and it's paid off in spades. I think we're going to stick to the time and thank Dr. Ribbido very, very much for coming back. And also, there is a great deal of pride uh, for the dean, for the faculty, to see the next generation and how incredibly impressive uh, this has worked out to be and how proud we are that you are part of this family as well. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you.